Welcome to the webinar. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, Malaysia Tourism on the Border. Hi there, everyone. My name is David Johnson, and I'm the CEO of Delivering Asia Communications, and I will be your moderator today. Um, right, so today is Malaysia. Malaysia, one of Southeast Asia's most dynamic destinations. I mean, in Asia, we've been really riding the COVID um, pandemic altogether, but the recovery seems to be coming. Uh, lockdown is over um, and there's, there's some green shoots emerging and we're gonna be talking about that today. We're gonna to be talking about domestic tourism. We're gonna to be talking about tourism attractions. We're gonna be um, some blue sky thinking on next generation Malaysian hospitality, um, et cetera, et cetera. But, but really um, a lot of the questions that we've received before this session, I've been focused on the green bubble, on, on the travel bubble. So we're going to be looking at that too. Um, and there's two thirds of Malaysian tourists who come from ASEAN. So is that bubble going to come from ASEAN? So these are some of the issues that we're going to be talking about. Um, just before we get going and very quickly, just a couple of housekeeping issues, please. So there's a Q&A function below your screens. Please uh, put in your questions there. I'll be compiling the questions as we go. And then after all the presentations, we will be getting to those questions and we'll get to absolutely as many of them as possible. The other key thing is that the session is going to be recorded. So everyone who's registered will receive a recording of the session and all, all the presentations afterwards. So right, let's get going. Um, and, the, and first up, we have KL Tan. KL Tan is the managing director of Sunway Group. KL, KL um, welcome today. Thanks so much. Hi, for hello, everybody. The weather is fine in Kuala Lumpur. No, very, very pleased to hear that. Um, we're just going to run through some run through some key questions. Um, if you could please update us on the situation in Malaysia, Malaysian hospitality. How has things been handled during COVID? Well, well, COVID is an uh, interesting uh, virus that cuts across um, everybody. It, it's, it's, there's no barrier in race, in colours. And it's just these tiny little fellas that really turn the whole world upside down. Um, and when it hit us uh, way back in January, in a very small way, uh, we, we were sort of uh, ignoring a lot of things and business was as usual. And then when, uh, when it, it hit us the second time, which is a little bit harder, and the government decided to lock down. So on the March of 18, the entire country come to, not a complete lock, lockdown, we call it the movement uh, control, uh, MCO. So when the MCO happens, obviously uh, only some key essential, uh, uh, what they call, shops are open, the rest are all closed. Hotels was badly hit because we are not allowed to even take in any customers except those that will continue to stay in the hotel and until they check out. And they won't check out because there's no way they can go anyway. It's a lock, it's, a, it's an effective border lockdown. They can't travel either. So in that respect, um, we were, we were, it was difficult because costs continue to run and you cannot take in any customers. But what we were saved a little bit was by the government of Malaysia who then thrown in financial packages to support not just the, the, the hospitality industry uh, in all respect. So um, uh, I was, there, there's a big numbers of uh, staff who Wow, sitting down there doing nothing. So, uh, and obviously the, the way to go about is to really cut resources, um, close down the hotels, um, and at the same time, uh, do whatever necessary um, to maintain the hotel, to do those things that you're not able to do when the hotel was running live. So in that respect, um, it's bad because as of today, I think about 35% easily of the hotels are unable to operate. And we, we reckon that probably 15 of those will not be able to survive as well. And for us, um, we, we took the opportunity to uh, do some situations as well. Yes. But the government of Malaysia has given uh, substantial support, both financially and also uh, in all sorts of other efforts. 
assets owners like us who who obviously uh, works on bank loans the government has in fact asked the banks to support for risk not restructuring the loans but to uh, to to allow uh, uh, what they call space out in terms of uh, repayments of loans so in that respect it, it does help uh, quite a fair bit in terms of helping us on the financial uh, burden that's great that's great to hear KL how about the domestic market I mean post lockdown domestic markets are allowed to travel how much has this helped you at Sunway and um, and and can the domestic um, the domestic market really help sustain the recovery of the hospitality industry no, but then again, don't forget, uh, during the MCO, we were not allowed to take in any guests. So we were, mm -hmm. we were all suffering for usually two or one months uh, until the recovery. They call it the, uh, rec the RMCO, the recovery of the MCO. And that was the time they allowed them to allow some of the domestic uh, guests to stay. But during that period, it's because Malaysian government allowed um, Malaysians who have been stuck overseas Students who has been uh, in overseas are allowed to return, but then they have to then go through the quarantine period of 14 days. Um, it, was, it was big numbers coming back, you know, tens of thousands. So the government of Malaysia then has supported in a way, in two prompts. One is to ensure that the COVID is under well control by having quarantine 14 days when they return. And the government then has in fact gazetted quite a number of Malaysian hotels as quarantine centers. And the government supports it by, in fact, the cost of pickup by the government. Uh, with three meals a day, 14 days lockdown, the entire hotel is taken over by the government as quarantine centers. Help officers is in there, police is in there to ensure that you know, everybody behave, follow the SOPs. So that, in a way, has helped some of the hotels, but not all. Yeah. What do you think about, um, I mean, um, with, with, with COVID, it's all given us some time to take a bit of a step back in the industry. Um, it, I mean, do you, do you feel at Sunway that this is a, a chance to reset, um, look at some of the issues in the industry and, uh, and, and position Malaysia differently, do some things different? And what, 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 what are your plans? We, absolutely, because, is it because uh, we, we take a lot of things for granted in the past, right? When the market was hot, things was going well. Um, the COVID really made us think through hard, uh, put a lot of things that are not able to be done in the past happened today. I give you one example, like in, 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 in Sunway itself, we, we, we own theme parks, restaurants, hotels, um, shopping centers, medical centers, education, you name it, it's all down here. And the three key components, the theme park, the shopping center, the hotels, they are all adjacent to each other. Uh, and to get the three components to work together as one, to sell a product, was difficult in the past because everybody, every division is doing very well. So you know what I mean? So, but, but when COVID hit us, we all suffer the same fate. And that's the time you sit back and you have to rethink, how do we go forward? The way to go forward, you're not going to compete just on prices. Everybody throw prices anyway, the hotels are all empty. You're going to compete on product that you can offer. So in our case, we package our components, the hospitality components together, and then we, we structure it in the way that we can sell and offer to the market, domestic markets in particular. I mean, obviously, obviously at this stage, it's all domestic markets. And um, I, I give you examples that we, 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 we launched a campaign and over two weeks, we sold 18,000 rooms. You know, that's the way we go. Uh, wow. So the domestic market is something that you... People have been locked down for, for, for almost 100 days. They, they're all tired of their homes. They want to get out. So they want to have food outside. They want to get themselves, enjoy a bit of fresh air. And so you, could, you just got to package it, right? Mm. That's, great. That's great to hear. So, 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 so integrating, whether it's integrating. I mean, you're, you're fortunate enough to have so many different components. But, but, but the challenge um, uh, of you has been to, to take a step back and to, um, and to start putting those together into a really deeply um, integrated package. That sounds great. Um, but what, what about some of the other, other opportunities um, uh, for, for the industry? Um, you know, in terms of uh, what sectors do you feel have particular appeal? I know, I know Sunway is very, very, um, uh, very, very, very strong with family. I mean, are there any other particular areas that you think should be focused on um, for the industry as a whole, for the Malaysian tourism industry that have appeal? 
both domestically and internationally? Again, domestically, I think the industry itself is very fragmented, right? Um, you, you have got the, uh, uh, though it's all uh, governed under the Malaysian tourism in the, uh, industry uh, or ministry, but then it's, it's fragmented in the sense that you, you have got the, um, the, 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 the tour guides who works independently, you have got the coach companies, the transportation companies that work independently, you have got the ports, the, the, the immigration, including the government, they are also fragmented, but this round, really has weakened everybody up. That look, unity is strength. You have to unite to make sure that you get things clear very quickly. At the same time, you, because of the lockdown, customers go online. I know online is something that's already been always happening in the past, you know, through OTA and so on. But this particular round has really weakened up. You know, even people, the, the more elderly who are less IT savvy has today gone totally different. Everything they buy online, you get I me? Mean? So, 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 so the same things is for this industry. I think we should capitalize on that euphoria and move forward. To move forward between the organization, the industry itself has to take a step up to make that change as well. So I think this is really, you know, mind boggling. You got to be way ahead of others in order to be able to, to uh, compete and to capture the market the way you should. Yeah, that's a, and speed, that sounds a, speed, speed is the way to go. Excellent, really that sounds go absolutely fantastic. What, one, one final question for you, please. Um, so how's your business outlook for the rest of the year? You know, the business plan's gone out of the window with, um, uh, with, with COVID. How are you looking um, towards the end of the year? Yeah, to begin with, uh, cut, cutting costs is one of the things. Multitasking is the other way. Um, making use of the Malaysian multi-racial society as a way to, uh, to really reinvent the market. Um, early on, when we asked about domestic market, whether it's sustainable, the answer is it is not because, you know, the whole Malaysian, uh, Malaysia as a whole, we have something like 300, 350,000 rooms and we only have something even at the peak, less 30 million tourists a year so you work it out it's just not able to fill uh, um, a domestic right. market so obviously you know international market is still a key to us in 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 our component here we um, uh, in the past our domestic market occupied something like 40 50 percent the remaining is actually foreign markets and the country as a whole uh, i'm not an expert in that field but obviously um, it's basically 60 40 uh, so without um, foreign tourists, it's, it's a very, very tough market for, for this industry as a whole. Well, we're going to get, get to later. So, uh, so I know a lot of, a lot of companies um, have got their fingers crossed that we'll be able to create these perhaps in, in, in the ASEAN market. But, um, but, but KL Town, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us and, 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 share, and sharing your insights. Um, the digital acceleration, the industry coming together. And there is positive, um, there are positives to, to, um, that we can take out of this. Um, please stick around. Um, uh, there'll be some other questions for you later. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm going to move on. Um, oh, just quickly before I do move on, um, the, the Q&A function at the bottom, um, everyone who's, who's, who's listening, we've got almost 500 people listening, um, please just pop in your questions as you go, um, and I will get those questions um, uh, at the end of the session. Kael Tan, thank, thank you very you. much. Right, we are now off to the man with the numbers, Jesper Palmquist, Area Director, Asia Pacific, STR. Jesper, please. Thank you. Sound and vision check, you okay with me there? Perfect. Excellent. Thank you very much. And, and thanks everyone dialing in. Hope everyone's okay. Appreciate Delivering Asia and C9 for hosting this, of course. I agree that it was time for a chat about Malaysia because it's more than what you read in the, in the news about other things. So it's time for us to talk about this. So on the agenda today, it's, it's pretty straightforward because yes, we are seeing some signs, but I usually take the data approach and say we still have a long way to go. I'll give you a quick history, some variations and a couple of factors. The first starting point on my first slide is really to say, you know what, the good news is that hotels have reopened around the world, not just here, but around the world. This colorful map is just showing complete difference from what we saw uh, a month ago, two months ago, where so much was red. We now have the ability to stay in hotels if we can. So it's now down to the local restrictions. So to give you the historic 
uh, relevance a little bit. The bars to the right in this slide shows quarterly occupancy in the last few years. And for most markets in Asia Pacific, 2018 was a high water mark. Not so much in Malaysia. You'll see there's a slight downward trend around it, but the dark bars to the right shows that uh, second half of 2019 bounced back. Where did we enter this horrific year 20? Kind of a medium to low spot historically. Occupancy wasn't exactly trending high. And in terms of the average daily rates and the ADR, it's a similar story on the graph to the right, how they are trending a little bit down. If you look in the last 10 years, you'll see occasionally you have five percentage points of burst of rate growth and everyone's going, okay, here we go. It's time to raise the rates, but it's not really happening. So in the last couple of years, the, the shoulder and low seasons have, have limited that as well. So we enter this year uh, in a pretty low, medium to low scenario. And if you look at the heat map over the last 20 years, I'm showing you this so you realize that in this third quarter, extended into June where we are now, those green dots represent better occupancy, right? So basically, if you do a year over year comparison at the start of this recovery, it's gonna hurt a little bit extra because historically that's the better months of the year. Now, rate wise, if I do the same thing, it's more spread out. And the red at the top is, you know, it was lower rates back then and lower sample. But in the last 15 years, you can see how the green dots are more spread out and less movements within those. And you also see at the bottom how COVID and the rate kind of dropped a little bit later. This shows it on the next slide much clearer. The purple line dropped after occupancy and revenue per available room. So it stayed up and helped, which is common around all of Asia Pacific, all the trends we've seen, bounces down to minus 50 compared to last year and now up to about minus 25. So where we are right now, which is very similar to other markets is, there are some ups and downs if it's schemes, you know, what's given, uh, tax reliefs, whatever it is, some comebacks and migration and a repatriation of people, isolation guests. We are right now in kind of like a second phase of recovery, uh, as you see at the end. So let's zoom in, because one of the new things that we've seen in the past six weeks is the Saturday staycation. So exactly to, to Dato's good point about people being cooped up, MCO has been lifted, I need to get out of the house. It's been the same everywhere, right? So we're starting to see it. Now, having 40% on a Saturday night is not gonna save anyone's business, but it's a lot better than nothing, right? And the ability to sell and put something on the books for those weekend stays is obviously uh, important. Now, one of the other factors that we see around the region has been uh, the entire Asia Pacific has been the difference in where the location of the hotel is as it starts to open up with restrictions. Now, in this example, central KL, surrounding KL, and then the wider state of Selangor. This makes perfect sense what we saw in China, uh, earlier in Japan, in Korea, and Australia, everywhere, that if people have the time and ability and the money to go out and finally get out of the house, they prefer to go a little bit outside the city, right? So that's a trend we're seeing also here. If we look at Speaking of real regions, big regions like Johor and also East Malaysia, the difference between these two, right in Johor, sure in JB here across the border, you'll see some of the staycations starting to happen a little bit. Uh, but in East Malaysia, it's more limited, right? It's more straight line uh, and it's also around reaching that 30% occupancy mark. There's a bit of a difference than what you see in the more populated or the tourism markets. And speaking of high tourism markets, clearly, we do continue to closely monitor uh, Malacca, Penang, and Langkawi. One of the main differences between these two on weekend behavior is that Langkawi gets two nights, right? Here's the difference on driving and flight to destinations. Langkawi gets Friday and Saturday. Penang and Malacca have to be happy with one night for now in that spike that we're seeing so far. And I mean, it helps. No hotel fees. We see the sales and service tax until uh, end of the year. Uh, some things are happening there. We're seeing meetings in corporate and leisure happening, but it's, it's still some way away um, uh, to really hit it, but obviously it's, it's helping what we're seeing. And just quickly across the bridge where I am, that bridge obviously went from being packed to very empty very quickly. Everyone is looking forward to uh, that reopening now in August for us, you know, uh, people who can travel around and then stay on both sides. Because these days we talk about recovery scenarios, that check mark up there, and it looks like this blue line is actually Singapore's occupancy since the start of the year. So it's perfect, that's what they're doing. Well, not really, because it doesn't have 90% occupancy. It's almost entirely isolation guests and it's a lease of hotel rooms. That means they report 100% even if three beds are busy in the hotel. So no, Singapore is totally reliant. You think in Malaysia needs uh, inbound, Singapore needs it 100% almost. 
their staycations and marketing campaign. They need Malaysians coming across the border, absolutely. I also wanna talk about how su new supply affects because people still wanna build hotels and grow Malaysia long-term. There's an 8% growth in rooms expected in the next couple of years, uh, so until the end of 21. It's not a crazy number. It's actually down from what we saw a couple of years ago, but this will put pressure on hotels uh, that are already in the market, of course, that want to capture some business. So one of the points I've been saying recently, yes, and after says domestic business, that's where you are now. You have to start planning for that yesterday, if it's business and leisure, because in our view, based on governments from Australia, from China and the big feeder markets, I don't expect any big source market coming in this year. And it's only five months left, right? but it's more hoping for 21. I'm not one of those guys that are like, oh yeah, it's gonna massively come in in, in two months from now. I don't, yeah, I don't see it. So these parameters, the recovery is gonna be longer. Demand comes first, but it won't mean occupancy straight away because of new hotels and it's very uh, spread uh, around many different uh, uh, hotels. Then you grow ADR and hit profit margins. So it's interesting to look at that. You can map out and get ready. My last piece is just around what what's, What's the advice here, right? Well, you gotta look, are you luxury or economy? Like service, service departments has held up pretty well. Are you a big conference hotel? Are you now competing with small boutique as well, which you never did in the past? Supply will hit differently in various locations as well. So there is a new competitive landscape uh, for a little while as well. So my advice, apart from please making it a Rojak night tonight, because that's what I was thinking about before, but seriously, the advice that I think is reasonable is that proactively think about how will you react to this returning demand, this domestic that you can look at China, what happened, a lot of that will be replicated in Malaysia. That includes evaluating the past rates, your inquiry period, event periods, how are they relevant to your market? So you need to then re recalibrate who are your new competitors for this limited demand in the short to medium term, and then set those assumptions up and hopefully you find enough data points that give you that view as well. So not a, not a super dark uh, outlook, of course, but it's a long way to go. That's my reminder. And any questions we don't uh, feed today, please uh, let us know and reach out to us as well. But let me hand back and then make sure that Hannah, Hannah's got a great site covering ASEAN. I keep people up to date. So uh, for the engine to start running, don't go anywhere. Stay tuned, plenty to come. Thank you guys. Yes, but thanks very much. Goodness, um, pretty challenging landscape here I'm, uh, um, uh, you're uh, depicting there. Um, and a lot of work to do for everyone. I um, love the sound of the Saturday, Saturday staycation. Um, that's why I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna focus my thinking. But we're off to Hannah, Hannah, Pin Hannah Pearson, founder of Pear Anderson. Hannah, please, we're over to you. Sure, thank you. So this afternoon I'm gonna be talking about how can Malaysia position itself as a leading Muslim friendly destination. So before I go into that, I'd better define what do we actually mean by Muslim friendly. Um, so Muslim friendly essentially is a Muslim traveler wanting to travel, but wanting to travel while still respecting their own unique needs. And so those unique needs typically revolve around two things. So one, um, halal food and beverage, and the other is finding a place and a time to pray. Obviously, this depends from individual to individual, you know, the importance they place on that. But generally, when we talk about Muslim tourism, that's that's what we're talking about. So is it a big market? Absolutely, yes. Um, by 2060, one in three of the world's population are going to be Muslim. Right now, that's one in four. Um, and this market is expected to grow. It's expected to grow to $274 billion by 2024. So there's a huge potential there, too. Now, how is Malaysia doing in terms of that? Mm, I would say so-so. So last year, they had about 5.32 million Muslim visitors visiting. That's only about 20% of Malaysia's arrivals. Now, obviously, Malaysia as a destination, you know, has a, a really robust Muslim-friendly tourism infrastructure. It's a Muslim-majority country. You have an Islamic uh, certification authority, Jakim, who certifies everything from food to cosmetics. Um, Tourism Malaysia have also established the Islamic Tourism Center. So that does um, educational workshops for stakeholders. It does its own um, Muslim friendly hotel certification process. Um, and it also has resources for Muslim travelers. Malaysia is also consistently ranked number one as destination in the Global Travel Muslim Index um, by 
and MasterCard, and it, it's been number one since that ranking has, has been around. But what's really interesting is when you look at where Malaysia falls in terms of how much spend it actually gets from worldwide Muslim tourists. So last year, although it's being ranked number one as top Muslim friendly destination, it's actually only getting number 10 in terms of inbound Muslim spend. And that's actually behind Singapore, that's behind Thailand, that's behind China. Um, so clearly there's a big potential and they're not quite hitting it. So what can they do? And this is where we need to look at where um, their Muslim tourists are coming from. So Tourism Malaysia earlier this year shared their 2019 um, stats and they shared that most of their Muslim tourists come from countries like Saudi Arabia, you'd expect that from places like China, India, Indonesia, Thailand, um, Singapore. But again, let's turn this around and let's look at where the top Muslim outbound markets are from in general. Yes, some of these are the same. We can see Saudi Arabia here, obviously like the number one in terms of outbound spend. But there are some really interesting countries here that are quite unexpected. So you can see USA, UK, Germany, France. These are all countries with actually a really high Muslim outbound travel spend. And they are not countries that are automatically thought of as having Muslim travelers. And I'm sure that tourism Malaysia, again, is not really focusing the marketing on those countries towards these Muslim travelers, yet they still have the same spending power and they're still going to be attracted to visiting Malaysia. So it's really almost a marketing problem. You know, they have the infrastructure, but they need to twist the concept of where these travelers are coming from. Once they start to kind of realign that and realize that Muslim travelers actually can come from pretty much anywhere, it's then starting to segment it because of course, you know, Muslim travelers are not one heterogeneous group. They don't all want the same kind of thing. Now, NTOs are still really behind in terms of this kind of sophisticated segmentation of Muslim travelers. Um, and I would say the only one who I can see sort of starting to get it is Singapore Tourism Board. So this year in their Muslim friendly guide, they actually released a couple of travel itineraries and these are specifically geared towards Muslim travelers. So you can see here, this is a family fun itinerary um, aimed at Muslim families. And they have another itinerary which is aimed at what they call the modern millennial Muslim. But this needs to go even further, you know, it can't just stop here. They need to then think about what this is in relation to nationalities. So what would a modern millennial traveler from the UK want versus a modern millennial traveler from the USA versus from Indonesia? They really need to segment at that level because of course it's different consumer behaviors from different markets as well. And what's really, you know, every year I put together this report about um, what online resources NTOs are producing, particularly non-Muslim um, countries, are putting together for Muslim tourists. Um, and I look at things like how comprehensive the resources are, what kind of formats they do, and so on. Now, I haven't released the 2020 um, results yet. That's coming out in a couple of weeks. But what I used was the same criteria to assess Malaysia against these other countries. And Malaysia, despite having all of these infrastructure all of this muslim friendly infrastructure there they're still only coming actually in number five behind countries again singapore and thailand behind you know countries like japan south korea hong kong these are not countries travelers would be comfortable traveling to a lot of pork um, alcohol um, but still they're beating malaysia out so to kind of sum up what malaysia really needs to do is have a a shift in focus. Yes, of course, you know, they, they could get more Muslim friendly hotels, but I think hotels here are already pretty Muslim friendly. It's rethinking that marketing message, who getting to, getting more specific, segmenting those travelers, and then going one step further and developing online resources aimed at those travelers to, to attract them to visit Malaysia. So that's, that's just a really kind of quick overview of, of where Malaysia is at. Of course, you've got questions, reach out to me or drop them in the Q&A. Thanks. Um, 
Sorry about that. Um, thank you, Hannah. That was superb. Really, really interesting stuff. A great chance to, for, for us all to reset and think a little bit differently. Um, okay, um, we're on to, um, uh, to Horworth. Horworth HTL, um, Director, Sensun uh, Sen 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 Man. Um, Sen, please. Right. All right, can everyone hear me? Very well, thank you. All right, okay. Thanks, David, uh, for pronouncing my name correctly. Um, anyway, over the next few slides, uh, we'll look at the um, uh, how hotels can break, uh, sort of do some break-even analysis during this pre-COVID-19 days, and using these numbers to uh, as a benchmark for industry players to navigate through these trying times that we're, we are facing now. Um, and also, I have some slides from Skyscanner, uh, which could be quite interesting. And these are the slides which tells us what was the trend over the last 50 days, and basically telling us, is anyone looking at Malaysia at the moment, you see? So, okay, now the question that we need to ask is reopen, all right? So preparation and planning is key. Now, where is the financial and non-financial sweet spot for reopening? So one has to bear in mind that reopening too soon could lead to more bleeding. So the next question to ask is, has the market recovered adequately to enable short-term survival of a hotel? Now, the expected surge in domestic tourism in Malaysia is creating some hope among hoteliers, but of course, domestic tourism isn't enough. Um, for 2019, based on our uh, <clears throat> annual hotel survey, uh, Malaysian hotels only captured 45% of domestic uh, demand, you see. So another 55% actually comes from international. So there you can see that 45% is definitely not enough. But for now, we just have to make do with um, domestic tourism. So the question of reopening is very relevant here. Um, now, reopening up costs money, more so with new operating costs that we need to spend to, uh, to comply with uh, government regulations on hygiene protocols and so forth. Um, but then again, on the other side is a prolonged closure could cost more money and worse if your competitors opened, um, they will increase market share at your expense or even hire your staff. So all these considerations have to be taken into account. So in general, I think what you need to do is do some groundwork, <clears throat> get your staff to talk to industry pl uh, players, get regular updates on the government reopening plans, talk to MAH, the Malaysian Association of Hotels, airlines, and airport authorities on their plans as to when they're going to um, open and launch flights. Um, and then you have to run numbers on reduced guest room inventory, uh, operational expense, both variable and fixed, of course, and overheads that need to be incurred. Um, but make sure your numbers make sense because whatever you put in, right, is garbage in, garbage out. Um, run sensitivity analysis, what happens at 50% occupancy, 30% occupancy, or even 45% occupancy. Um, and then you have to take into other strategic considerations, CAPEX spending like M&E maintenance, staffing levels, reskilling um, expenses, recontracting, and all that, you see. Now, for break-even analysis, this is what is basically the snapshot. Now, units sold basically is room nights sold. Now, one of the methods you can use is, of course, this analysis. Now, this analysis is an assessment of your hotel's performance. At what level will the fixed variable costs element of cost is covered by revenue so that you can start to make profit? Um, break even happens, of course, at the uh, cross line is when your variable and fixed costs are covered. Um, in addition to the operational fixed element cost, now you have to consider other fixed costs which are not operational, like lease payments, insurance, property taxes, interest on loans, rent and rates, and so forth. Um, so this analysis will give you financial reasons for reopening. Um, the next following few slides are snapshots of what break even was during happier times and when analysis conducted and this analysis was conducted from data collected through our annual Malaysian Hotel uh, Industry Survey of Operations calendar year 2019, um, which, whose report will be released next week. Now, <clears throat> for Malaysia, 
the break-even ref par, which is revenue per available room, is 155 ringgit. Um, that's uh, about 36 US dollars. Um, but for KL specifically, it's 145, slightly lower. And I've shown that four categories of hotels, break-even analysis, ref par, according to the average room rate achieved. Now this is, as I mentioned, is from our hotel survey data. Okay. Now, the components of the break-even ref par is basically occupancy and ADR. Now, for Malaysia, all right, it's at 46% occupancy to reach break-even at the ADR of 336. And for KL, it's not much different, 45%, and not much different from the ADR, which is 326. Now, um, <clears throat> for the other four categories of hotels, okay, um, you can see that as you go more towards the higher end, all right, it requires less occupancy. That's because of the, the room rate that is considerable um, higher to cover the cost, you see. So that's why as you move from economy to um, five-star, high-end five-star, your occupancy level decreases. But of course, your break-even ADR also increases. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> What are the steps by steps um, that you need to do? Okay, now first you need to estimate your carrying costs. Now you're not starting from scratch. No, you're not. So what are your existing carrying costs? Now this could include running costs and a lean manpower. Now you should have some staff still on board like security and housekeeping to keep your hotel running. Now utilities are also a carrying costs. So because you need to um, provide electricity and air conditioning for your long-term guests if they're still staying at your hotel and for those short-term guests who are also staying in your hotel, okay? And of course, as I mentioned earlier, the new hygiene and compliance protocol costs would have to be considered. And then you need to review your business model and operational structure. Now, how was the business previously? Possible significant changes to market mix, definitely less mice in this time perhaps more government demand as the market slowly reopens. And this will in turn affect seasonality and rates occupancy. Now, do you need all your F&B outlets to open, which will impact operational costs and staffing level? Now, as you know, during this COVID days, buffets, if the hotels open, buffets could be the thing of the past. Even when it reopens, right, the hotel reopens, buffets could still be the thing of the past. So consideration of opening your restaurants comes into play, okay? And also hotels are forging partnerships with independent restaurants and food delivery services rather than keeping their hotel kitchens open. Um, the days of daily made and turned down service could be numbered as these services could become on-demand service. So adopting much more of a service apartment model, even for high-end five-star hotels. Okay, and then guest supplies such as, such as stationaries or even minibars could be a thing of the past. So what is the new trash toll? your break even ref part, you have to calculate that. And then and reopening costs. Now this would include new hygiene requirements, protocol, retraining, recruitment, pre-opening staff, and all these costs have to be considered. Now, so basically, yeah, sit down with your team and sort out the monthly cash flow. Does it really stack up? So I've done a high, hypothetical scenario of a hotel with 400 keys, which is upper to upper up, upscale hotel with an ADR of between 300 and 400 ringgit and reopening in September, 2020. Um, so these are the costs comparing as is and reopening. Okay, again, this data is from our annual analysis from data which are actually submitted by hotels. So as you can see, as is, which is remain close, will incur much more um, money on your pocket, approximately 3.8 million ringgit in the four months to the end of the year. Whereas by reopening, it's close to 2 million. See? But of course, you have to consider the reopening costs, which I factored in there as well. See? So in other, 
intangible benefits have to be considered as well in the reopening of your hotel. Now, staff is the most important um, asset of your hotel. We need to take care of them, all right? So try and have them in your payroll as much as you can, okay? And then you have to keep the, the local economy plodding along. That means your local supply chains. Now you have to keep them in business because if you don't, once, they, once you reopen and they're no longer in business, you have some issues there, some standards issues there. See? And of course, other relationships like maintenance suppliers, wholesale agents and all that. Keep them running as much as you can, all right? But be careful, I mean, don't jump the gun, all right? Reopen when everything is aligned, when the stars are aligned, when the local authorities are clear on the advice, but avoid reopening and then reclosing because to do that would be very costly. As I mentioned, the Skyscanner slides, right? Now, these are the slides which I've obtained from Skyscanner. Um, now, for the last 50 days, the search demand um, by the customers of Skyscanner, Kale and Penang, is, as you can see, is quite flat. Now, overall search demand to Kale and Penang in the last 50 days, between June the 2nd and July the 22nd, all right, it's been edging towards the highs of 18 to 20,000 searches per day. Now, while this has remained relatively constant, despite the usual fluctuations throughout, we are seeing an increase of around 2,000 to 3,000 searches since the start of June. Now, this may not be a huge uptake in the number of searches. Now, it will be of some reassurance to the industry that there are still a large amount of daily searches of 18,000 to 20,000 for travelers to KL and Penang. Now, the next two slides will give you a breakdown of KL and Penang, as you can see, KL is rather flat, okay? But on the other hand, Penang, you can see a much higher steep increase with a higher gradient. But bear in mind, it's from a low number. As you can see on the left side of the, uh, the uh, chart, it's close to uh, 2,000 only, you see, right? Now, in terms of search demand to KL and Penang, um, where do these travelers want to go? Or when, sorry, do travelers want to travel? Um, around 64% of searches were made in July and August, suggesting that there is a short time in booking, a short lead time in booking. Um, while there is some demand for later months in the year and the first quarter of 2021, this is not substantial yet. Search demand by origin of country, demand from Penang and KL's key origins have stayed largely stable in terms of the percentage of total demand that they make up. If anything, we are seeing a slight increase. Yeah, in, if anything, we are seeing an increase in domestic demand. This has always been strong, you see. Hi, Sam, we've got just a, we've just got one more minute so we can wrap up, please. Yeah, we have one more slide, and this is the last slide. Um, now, this is redirect, which is a strong intention to travel, you see. Um, this is where a customer leaves Skyscanner to complete the booking at either an OTA or an airline website. And it's a strong indicator of conversion because if it's far into the booking and in recent weeks, we have seen a gradual improvement in the daily number of redirects versus the start of the shown period. All right, that's it, thank you. Brilliant, Sen, thank you so much. Um, um, I, I know you had to go through some of those slides a little bit quickly. Please be reminded everyone that, that it's gonna be possible to download these slides and go through them in more, more, more detail later. Sen, thanks so much. Right, we're off to, um, uh, we're gonna be running through a series of short, sharp, quick fire presentations and commentary. Um, first, we're gonna be um, on, on, on new ideas for the industry. First, we're gonna be starting with Reza Cockrell, co-founder of The Habitat. Reza, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Bill, and thank you, Sumi, for uh, inviting me to participate in this. Um, and hello to everybody who's uh, tuning in. Uh, my name is Reza Cockrell, and together with my father, I am uh, the founder of the Habitat Group, uh, which consists of uh, the Habitat Penang Hill and the Habitat Foundation. Um, so at the Habitat Penang Hill, uh, it's a nature park, a rainforest discovery center, 
set uh, at about 900 meters above sea level, just above uh, Georgetown, Penang. Um, uh, in it, it's a revenue driving uh, park uh, with F&B facilities. Uh, it's a curated uh, nature trail with uh, naturalists who take people around and uh, show interesting flora and fauna. Uh, but most importantly, uh, it's attached to the Habitat Foundation, the sister organization that looks to reinvest uh, the profitability from the Habitat Penang Hill in uh, biodiversity conservation efforts throughout the region. Uh, so at the Habitat Group, our vision is to be an impactful business in balance with nature. And our mission to do that is to conserve, educate, and inspire. So on the conservation side, we want to prove that uh, hospitality models uh, can maximize social and economic environmental benefits, uh, not just for the uh, hospitality provider, but for all communities involved. Uh, on the education side, we want to provide great programs that uh, people always come away from uh, the habitat having learned more about their natural environment, about why conservation matters. Uh, but we also want to provide good educational content for schools, educational institutions, research, research institutes around the world. And on the inspiration side, we hope to inspire other people to look for more products like this, to get more involved in the natural world, um, and inspire other businesses to look at a similar model of, uh, uh, of what we're trying to do. So we've been at this since about 2012. Uh, uh, we're a 14 hectare site, as I said, at the top of Penang Hill. Um, in 2016, we started uh, with our soft launch and that's our 1.6 kilometer nature trail uh, that, uh, that uh, is a guided experience that we have about 20 very young, passionate uh, and very highly trained naturalists. Um, in 2017, we launched uh, uh, our Curtis Crest treetop walk, which is that big, um, treetop walk that you can see in the middle of the photo there. Uh, and then a year later in 2018, uh, we finished the park, uh, which includes the Langer Way canopy walk, which we can see in the, uh, the, the long bridge there, as well as a, a zip line trail. And last year, we finally uh, uh, founded uh, our Habitat Foundation and registered it with uh, the government of Malaysia. So uh, as it's today, uh, we aim to be a world-class rainforest discovery center. We didn't want to build to Malaysian standards. We wanted to build to the best in class out there. Uh, we're just six kilometers away from uh, Georgetown, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, and we tried to position ourselves as a model of uh, public-private partnership. Uh, we lease the land from government. Uh, we share our revenue with government as well. Uh, but we really do try to uh, uh, help all uh, communities and stakeholders around us. As I mentioned before, our revenues derive from entrance tickets, guided tours, team building events, uh, uh, F&B and retail. Uh, but uh, everything that we make, we pledge back into the Habitat Foundation. Now, this is a quick overview of the park. You can see our bridge systems, our canopy walks, uh, on-demand tents where we hold events, uh, zip line trails and things like that. At the foundation, um, our aim here is to work closely with communities, scientists, academic institutions, NGOs, uh, to really work about uh, uh, protecting natural environments um, uh, and really start thinking about uh, hospitality and sustainability in this part of the world. Uh, the pillars of the foundation are conservation, research, education, sustainability and innovation, and training. And this is, a, this is an example of the kind of work that we do there. So uh, uh, here uh, at Royal Bulum in Perak, uh, we've sponsored indigenous societies who go out and help uh, uh, cultivate uh, uh, endemic plants, uh, trees, saplings, uh, bushes, and all that uh, from the rainforest environment, which we then propagate in nurseries, both inside national parks, but uh, on private land as well. Um, and which we use to reforest uh, the central spine. Um, we've also done similar work with uh, replanting mangroves in uh, 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 just outside of Penang. Um, we do a lot of species conservation work, working with NGOs. Uh, for example, uh, the pigtailed macaque as a, uh, is an endangered animal in Malaysia. Um, it has a bad reputation amongst farmers and are seen as pests. Uh, but we've found that uh, they are actually a great prevention of uh, pests like rats and civet cats that endanger palm oil plantations. 
And the work that we're trying to do is to reorient the thinking behind uh, uh, plantation owners' uh, uh, relationship with, with animals like the macaque. Uh, even fruit bats, for example. Malaysia has a absolute love re uh, relationship with uh, durian. And uh, durian farmers have long believed that the uh, fruit bats uh, eat the durian fruit, but it's actually now found by research that uh, the Habitat Foundation has helped sponsor that uh, the fruit bats are actually critical to uh, the pollination of durian trees. And we're now engaging in uh, education exercises with plantation owners to make sure that they understand that. And of course, big cats. Um, big cats are an important uh, icon of conservation. Uh, and some of the more innovative uh, work that we're doing are sponsoring genetic research on uh, analyzing uh, cat scat, or basically tiger poop, uh, to understand the health of their populations, the genetic makeup of their populations, and how they're broken up by plantations in, in, in uh, peninsular Malaysia. Um, uh, Reza, we're, 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 we're running out of time a little bit. Um, okay, um, I'll flick through it very quickly. Know, thank you. Uh, one, of the, one of the major things that we're working on right now, uh, sponsored by the Habitat, is uh, actually applying for a UNESCO Man in the Biosphere Reserve status for Penang Island. Uh, we've applied for about 13,000 hectares. That includes Penang Hill, uh, a national park, but also a marine park system, uh, which we find uh, a, a very important element of uh, maintaining that uh, conservation initiative, even if the habitat were not to be around. Uh, we sponsored a BioBlitz. We invited 117 scientists from around the world to come and work in Penang uh, to create the baseline science that goes into that uh, reserve. And uh, I'm also happy to announce that we've launched in the Philippines. Uh, we're, we've started to work on marine environmental systems. Uh, the picture that you can see here is Quattro Island. Uh, where we'll be starting work around sustainable fishing initiatives, coral harvesting, uh, and of course, sustainable tourism. So that's the model, uh, Penang Hill. Uh, profits go into the foundation. Foundation provides quality uh, value add-on uh, education initiatives that we hope enhance the, the park initiative. Um, and we want to show that we're walking the walk. Um, so to that end, uh, we've put in an application, uh, we have not received it yet, uh, but uh, we put in an application to become a B certified, a B Corp certified uh, business. Um, we're in our second round of interviews with them and we hope uh, to be the first B Corp certified company in Malaysia. Um, other things that we've done in the past uh, include things like minimal impact to environmental systems. As you can see in the bottom picture, that's a picture of our bridge being constructed. Um, each of those one ton segments was lifted by hand. We used no machinery, no trees were cut. Even the foundations of the bridge were hand dug by a, uh, by a team. Um, what's next for us? Uh, we're looking to build more parks in the region uh, that follow the same ethos. Uh, uh, the parent company of the Habitat Group is uh, uh, mainly in the food business. Uh, so we want to start linking our sustainable initiatives with uh, food education. So the Habitat Farms, is something that we're looking to build. Uh, and then finally, the Habitat Lodges, uh, which is an accommodation, a uh, tented camp system uh, that we're looking to build in uh, uh, national parks throughout Malaysia. And all, of course, are all linked to uh, the Habitat Foundation and the work that we do there. So thank you very much. Uh, just a reminder to come back to nature, whether you're in Malaysia or even in your own backyard. Uh, there's a lot of uh, fantastic things to find out there. So thank Reza, you. Thank you. Thanks, th thanks very much. Amazing work, very much a work of, of its time. Um, a number of people have commented um, uh, while, while we're going through the session and, uh, and the presentation is gonna be available. Just to remind everyone, can download afterwards. Right, let's move, let's move on. Um, Andreas Rudd, CEO, Riaz Hotels and Resorts. Um, changing faces, new ideas. Andreas. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, let me just see what's happening here. All right, you should be seeing the slides right now. Are we go? Um, no, we can't can't see can't see at the moment. Just need to share your screen. Um, oh Zumi, do you have do you have do you have the presentation available? If if um uh, if if we need to go to that, please.
Okay, great. Sumi so, so shared it for you, um, uh, 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 Andreas. How's that for service for you? Maybe we can go from this. Yeah. Okay, quickly, let me introduce, uh, we are RIAS, uh, we are a Malaysian company, we are fully integrated, we are in Malaysia, Indonesia, and Vietnam, uh, we have hotels, uh, F&B, uh, we have also a travel agent, as well as a development team in Bali. Um, we are here to uh, introduce how this uh, COVID-19 has helped us um, relook at our uh, pricing structures, our teams, etc. As you can see, we are um, strong uh, coming up in Vietnam with uh, five projects in the pipeline. Uh, we have one property since two and a half years in Da Nang, which as you know, have also been impacted since yesterday or the day before yesterday with a shutdown. Um, Malaysia, of course, and Indonesia are um, uh, a great combination. Uh, and our first hotel was up in um, Bali and um, Look, at the end of the day, we have had ceaseless stress on this industry. Um, uh, since I've come to this part of the world in 2000, uh, sorry, in 1995, we had everything of these sub six subjects thrown at us every time. And um, yes, COVID-19 has been um, a long, uh, around much longer than it was supposed to be <laughs> or <laughs> at, at any stage of any uh, disruption to the industry. But at the end of the day, um, um, it, it gave us the opportunity to reset uh, what we were doing and how we were looking at our businesses and our people, to be honest. So we went on to uh, uh, become um, aware of our situation. And we said, look, uh, we need to look at our local market first and foremost, because that's the first one that will return. And um, to be um, very clear, um, this is not an ad. We are at 50% of 2019. Uh, this is reality. Uh, we've been able to really go with a social network that we have built uh, in the local scene. Uh, we were never really a group hotel business. Um, we were always very reliant on FIT and looking towards uh, the local support uh, in all our hotels, maybe in Vietnam or Indonesia or Malaysia. Uh, the other part is that we have food and beverage uh, and uh, we also have retail shops with our own fashion that are uh, online um, purchased. Um, the group diversity that we have enables us today to survive the way we do. And the beauty is that we were able to, with our fiscal policy, we were able to uh, show to our team that we can sustain them for six months without uh, having a worrisome cash flow problem. And that was really the key that we've built over the last three years, our IoT and e-commerce strategies. Uh, we have great partners, third parties, and um, we've gone into retail, digital education. We have a college in Penang, um, we have development in Bali. We also have our own furniture um, plant and lighting plant up in Bali where we have quality control from start to finish. Uh, our next venture is OTA. We're gonna disrupt that business as well. And that is something that came up during COVID-19 uh, where the managing director and myself and uh, a couple of key players uh, were sitting together and uh, well, virtually sitting together and we're talking about what can we do? Where can we move forward? And we came up with the concept of a new way of an OTA e-commerce and e-concierge program, which will disrupt for sure. Um, digital, we are doing our own uh, virtual reality. Uh, all our hotels have virtual reality um, videos um, that are state of the art. Um, next will be, um, I would like to show a graph uh, from uh, STR, uh, the next slide, uh, which shows very clearly that what have we done uh, in our digital marketing that was different. And we've really concentrated on what do the people want? Where do they want to go? When the borders are opening, are we ready with our team, etc.? And we try to sustain our price premium 
And why we say we want to sustain our price premium and not dump our prices like uh, some of the neighbors did was simply because we didn't want to put stress on the team and have 100% or 80% occupancy without being ready and having not seen a customer for three months and haven't served one for three months. So we wanted to start off slowly. And uh, obviously the graph shows that we have created a, a very good environment for us to um, uh, sustain and actually bring in uh, cash uh, to help all the other businesses to uh, move forward. Uh, in regards to self um, independence and uh, being um, a, a hotel that really prides itself on, on the experience, uh, you can see that the customers in Malaysia, even during COVID-19, has not lost the edge of want to have fun and they want to experience luxury and good service. Um, and so also, uh, you can see the postings are uh, uh, this is another uh, Instagram uh, uh, subject uh, that I want to bring up. And this is about interacting with your customers right now is very important. And we've done that over the three months when we were in lockdown. And uh, when you can look into uh, the numbers of June 2020 to July, within one month, we achieved 10,000 followers. That is pretty impressive. And this is the staff that interacted with the people that came on the island they were not doom and gloom, they had fun. They created special packages for them. You look at the, the followships uh, that we had, um, it's very creative. Uh, people want something different. And the other thing I wanna mention is um, that a lot of people experienced us that actually experience other brands first and foremost and don't look at other Malaysian brands or uh, local brands per se, um, but they go just for the super brands or multinational brands which have their loyalty systems in place, et cetera. And uh, I would say that COVID-19 was a perfect opportunity for us to introduce ourselves to a new market, uh, to stress that uh, being new doesn't mean that uh, you're not as good as the rest. And uh, as the numbers show very clearly, um, our team is doing the right thing. So thanks for the five minutes. Andreas. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, digital marketing and business diversity um, were my two key, two, two key takeaways on that. Thanks very much. Um, great presentation. Um, right. Um, Ricky Yang. Ricky Yang, founder and director, CPA Hotels and, um, uh, and Resorts. Ricky, please. What do you have for us? Ricky, you there? Ricky, you need to unmute, please. Unmute, please. Fantastic. Gotcha. Can you, can you hear Loud me now? Loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So, um, good afternoon from Kuala Lumpur. Thank you again, David and Team DAC for organizing this webinar. Uh, I don't have a presentation deck to present, so I'm just going to, you know, yap away. Um, first off, I want to say that I'm certainly pleased to be given this opportunity to share my take on the Malaysian hospitality scene um, through my experience of starting up a hotel brand and management company. I will, of course, talk also on what lies ahead for all stakeholders in the hospitality industry and how it may shape the next generation of hospita hospitality leaders in Malaysia. First off, my heart really goes out to all hotel owners and to all hospitality professionals in this very challenging time. I know many of us have lost jobs and some hotels have literally called it a day. Bear in mind though, that whilst things may not be like what it was before, the premise here today must always be that travel, tourism and hotels will remain relevant into the conceivable future. Wanderlust and the need to explore is hard coded in our human DNA. And this will never change. Therein lies hope for us all. So let me first take you back to look at the Malaysian hospitality landscape before the pandemic. Many industry professionals will tell you that we were already facing massive challenges then. In the last eight years, there were huge spikes in available inventories across the country. 
First, you have the increase in new hotel developments. Then you have a whole slew of service residences that came online due to developers guaranteed rental returns promised to their unit owners. And then there was the mushrooming of budget and boutique hotels across the country. The availability of accommodation rooms really ballooned. Demand couldn't keep pace with, with, with the supply. Occupancies fell and rates started going south. And amidst all this, we were literally steamrolled with further inventory spikes through the unregulated and openly permissible short-term rental disruptions. Even without the pandemic, we were facing an industry crisis, not as sudden and dramatic as COVID-19, mind you, but a looming crisis all the same. It was against this backdrop that CPR Hotels and Resorts was founded. From where I was sitting at the time, a couple of years back as the CEO of a local hotel chain, I could see a vicious cycle forming. As profits did, owners resorted to cost cutting. These cuts affected quality. As hotel standards were compromised, consumers increasingly moved to alternatives like the unregulated short-term rental disruptors. Owners seriously needed help. They needed sound and experienced hospitality insights and expertise. I saw an opportunity for a homegrown brand like Sepia to fill that niche. So we asked the question, what can we bring to the table aside from the founder and our associates having years of operating hotels and resorts in the local scene? Well, for starters, we prided ourselves as being an indie hotel company. This means that we were unencumbered by volumes of rigid brand standards. We had a blank canvas. We wanted CPR to be able to offer a more bespoke adaptability to every owner's vision of their hotel. And we must always remember, it is the owner's hotel. Branding notwithstanding, the hotel belongs to the owner. We also wanted to be a very personalized and I guess a somewhat um, bijou kind of firm where the person you talk to will be the person who will get the job done for you and not relegated to someone else. We thought these were pretty sound strategies. And then we hit the wall, bang. You see, for all our unique advantages, we had two serious drawbacks. The first is that being an indie brand, we lack serious distribution on the global front especially in key supply markets like China. And China, as everyone can tell you, is a key focus for any Malaysian hotel moving forward. The second is from the banks. Many banks were reluctant to release loans for hotel developments in Malaysia due to the challenging market condition. And it would certainly help if the operator is a more well-known brand. And so our solution was to look for partners and not just any partners. We, were, we specifically wanted a partner from China because we know that this is where the big inbound travel volume to Malaysia is going to come from. So we partnered with a China-based hotel group, Gloria International, on all our management projects. And in return, CPL will represent Gloria in key areas outside of China. Now, all at once, we had the accreditation of... Sorry affiliated to an international chain. We had back-end resources from a big company and most importantly, an established China brand, an established China brand. Glorious distribution, reach and expertise in China markets is, is invaluable. And as we will see later on in further presentation, China is critically important for Malaysia. So moving it's on to through this. We asked how we can add value for guests and how we can compete what? with a type of accommodation offered by short-term rental disruptors. For example, we know that Malaysia is very much a family-oriented destination. And as such, we want our rooms to be able to accommodate a family of four, for, for instance. And we consider this not just from a bathing perspective, but also extended to other conveniences like the segregation of bathroom facilities for simultaneous use. After all, there's no point having four people being accommodated in a room and they will, can only use the toilet one at a time. Right. And, and on top of all this is what's critically important to cater to the China market is to get input uh, from China companies on things like soft amenities, because this will add to a comfortable sense of familiarity 
for our gas from China. Now that in a nutshell is pretty much what CPR is all about and, and the journey with CPR. I would like to segue now into the current um, situation brought about by the pandemic that we all- You've got about a, you got about a minute, Ricky, just to- um, sure. Okay, to just everything that I spoke about regarding the challenges the industry faced pre-COVID is simply magnified explosively now. So you must imagine what hotel owners are going through. If they needed help then, imagine what they must be going through now. What I see happening is that hotel owners and developers must know and realize the value of engaging external expertise to help them either to improve their business performances or to provide valuable professional input on their developments. Owners are, however, very reluctant at this point in time to consider long-term engagement commitments, but they would be very warm to the idea of a limited engagement where required expertise can improve their business and possibly even reduce their overheads without a locked-in perpetual commitment of an employment contract. Individual hospitality experts should start to frame and offer their specialized expertise to owners as well as to hotel companies on a project to project basis, very much like the gig economy concept. Hotel companies, mine included, will likewise need to pivot our suite of services to cover niches uh, over and above the standard overarching management contracts. And as managing a hotel is broad spectrum, I certainly do encourage individual professionals between themselves, as well as even with hotel companies to forge alliances and partnerships to tackle projects as they come along. And lastly, with all this, I really feel that there will be a significant trend for hotels to lean towards outsourcing entire functions or departments wholesale. Think third party reservation call centers, outsource retail revenue management, outsource the entire sales department and even the entire marketing division of your hotels. Hotels will need to go leaner as we go along. And that will be what I think the complexion of the next generation hospitality leadership will be like, in my humble opinion. Great stuff. Rick, Rick, Ricky, thank you. Some really good outspoken views for everyone to think about there. Bill, I'm going to hand over to you, Mr. Barnett. Hi, David. I've got just a few things to say today. And I, I don't know, this year has been a hell of a ride because every day I, I'm almost afraid to wake up in the morning and see what the news is going to say about where we are today. But I'm a hotel guy and I've got to understand as a hotel owner and operator, things are getting worse, no matter what you say. I'm not, you know, you know, realistically, today when I thought of talking, am I going to talk about green lanes? Am I going to talk about hope and everything else? Hope, hope is out there, right? Because as I said, everything in time, things will change. But what hotels have to understand, I sit in Thailand, and what I understand is that we're, th we're only surviving on domestic tourism. And I think my message to our friends in Malaysia is learn from Thailand a little bit, because we don't think in the short term or the medium term there's going to be international rivals. And what, we, what our hotels have learned to do is they're having to survive on domestic tourism. You know, international tourists in 2019, 26 million to, to Malaysia. When you look at domestic visitors in the country, you know, you've got 239 million, you've got 330 domestic, million domestic stays. That's your market. That's maybe going to be your market for the rest of this year. I mean, that's the reality of the situation. As I said, you've got to face it as a hotel now and say, this is the only business you can have. It's good to do break even analysis and everything else, but basically you just want to keep going. And I think keep the lights on and everything else. You've got to make that business decision. I think you've got to learn from the domestic market because this very well may be the only thing. Until there's going to be a vaccine out there or something else was as dramatic and going to change things, I don't think we're going to see international arrivals coming back into Asia. And that's something we've learned with, you know, we saw the situation in Thailand where we had all of a sudden we had some foreign visitors come and actually uh, with COVID-19 that created such a political outcry that they all of a sudden stopped that issue completely. And I think that's going to be sustainable. We've seen what happened in Vietnam this week also with 80,000 80, people evacuated from Da Nang. And I think we can learn from this because what we're trying to understand is we're in for the long run. So be in for the long game now as hoteliers, right? It's nice to again plan for these four overseas markets when they come back. But in my mind, I think you've got to understand that maybe 2021. So today we're going to sit here and say, what are you going to do for domestic tourists? What are you going to do to keep the lights on? What opportunities exist in your hotels for other revenue streams to say, 
food and beverage to say, are we going to outsource, are we going to have services we're providing within the community? Or do we actually shut the hotel down? God help us, we're going to shut down hotels. Maybe we are going to shut down some hotels. That's going to make more sense and come back in 2021 when it makes more economic sense. So I think that's what, the, you know, when we're having these discussions, I think you have to look at your business and understand that it's probably not going to get better in the near term. And that's okay because the whole world is undergoing this shitstorm of things out there. That's the reality of it. But again, it's a hotel business and they call it the hotel business for a reason because again, you've got to manage that as well for the long run. Hotel assets are going to be here for a long time, but you've got to understand the short term situation. Again, it's probably only going to be domestic situation. For Malaysia, the longer run, we understand. Three out of every four tourists are coming from ASEAN. Airlift is going to be everything. When, when you look at the stability of Malaysian airlines and AirAsia, this is critical to recovery. And it's probably going to come from within the ASEAN region. But for this year, you know, when I look at domestic visitors, I can see 40 million domestic visitors, Sabah, Sarawak, these kind of areas. So there is business out there. It's not going to be the best high rated business. Maybe you're not breaking even, but it's cash flow. I think that's really my messaging today. It's not being an alarmist, but it's understanding that 2020 is going to be a trying time for our business. Plan for it, address it proactively, find great ideas, but plan for this because it's probably going to get worse till it gets better. David, happy news, right? <laughs> Thanks for that, Phil. That's really, really uplifting. But is it? But it's an important <laughs> message and, uh, and and appreciated. So we've got we're going to do two things now. We're going to give Vanessa who's been sitting very patiently in Shanghai for the last hour and a quarter, a very, very a short time. Vanessa, could you please just yes. talk to us about, so China, if there is going to be one key market that's going to save us all from overseas, it's going to be from China. So very, very quickly, what do hotels have to do to get prepared for the China market? You've got two minutes to answer that question. And then I've, and then I've got two or three questions for our panelists. Vanessa. All right. So um, thanks, everyone. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to, for me to share about the consumer insights uh, in China market. So in past like two to three months, we've been running very, very um, many rounds of survey, looking at the, like, uh, the outbound market, um, you know, for the China tourists. And we find like the FIT definitely will be the major trend. And the people are looking at a cultural nature activities. So mainly it's for the experience. However, like the things, the traveling, um, the, the, the travelers, they're, they're getting young. So a uh, majority of the travelers who are between age, between 20 to 40. Therefore, they, uh, they are a heavy like uh, digital users. Therefore, um, so digital communication is very, very important. And we also find travelers, if they have money, they would like to go more luxury even than, than before. And for those people who used to go for economy, they are looking for safety and comfortable as well. Therefore, uh, so like a social but distance, uh, healthy and uh, hygiene and, uh, you know, and use a digital method to bring the hotel destination in front of the, the, the travelers are very important. And meanwhile, a must be here reason is, uh, I would say it's a key point to, 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 to allure um, our travelers um, into the hotel. And from the booking wise, before we pretty much are familiar with a sea trip, which is the major platform for uh, travelers to booking for the hotel. However, because the FIT has been growing dramatically, um, therefore we also use uh, the, the, the younger generation are using Fliggy a lot. Fliggy actually is, um, is, uh, is the tourism session of Taobao. Taobao, uh, you may know like Amazon worldwide, so we will see Taobao actually is the Amazon in, 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 in China. Everyone uh, go online shopping and everyone use Taobao. So Fliggy actually is the, is the tourism session of uh, Taobao. It's, uh, it's kind of like uh, each hotel could open a Fliggy store on, on, on the Fliggy platform. Therefore, it, with um, the payment method, Alipay, also owns by Alibaba. So Fliggy and, uh, and Taobao both owned by Alibaba. So um, it's kind of bring, uh, bring up a, 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 a ecosystem. So for the purchasing, you have Fliggy and the uh, hotel can launch its own products. No need to get the means, um, uh, consent from the OTA. And with the uh, Alipay as the payment, so the traveler, the traveler will use their mobile phone, just scan the QR code and just pay. 
directly and then the money goes into the LEP account, which directly to the hotel's account. And the meanwhile, we also have uh, the media tour, which is also partly owned by um, by Alibaba, it's called uh, Douyin. So it's like Instagram, but uh, feeding with a lot of uh, video um, video clips. So all sort of, and it also has like a live streaming uh, function. And during live streaming, uh, people can easily just purchase it by clicking the link. So with a Fliggy, Taobao, uh, Fliggy, we, uh, uh, Alipay, and, uh, and uh, Douyin. So it's kind of uh, the build up an ecosystem a Oasis system so people can, I mean, travelers can get information and then can, can, can link to purchasing and resolve payments straight away. And Vanessa, uh, thank you. has been grown up rapidly during the COVID period, yeah. Vanessa, thank you. And, and I'm sorry to cut you off, Emma. That's what happens yeah. when you're at okay. the end of these sessions, you know, you always get the, <laughs> the short straw. But some really, really important messages. I know it's gonna be a domestic focus, but if there's one market to focus on, um, uh, for, 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 for the future, it is China. The market's getting younger. It's become more digitally focused and get your channels ready. Uh, we've got time for two questions. Um, and I'm yeah. sorry there's, there's, there's not much time, but that, that's, that's where we are. Um, and the first question is for Kale Tan. Um, um, Dato Tan, are you still with us? Yes, of course. Oh, fantastic. Thanks for your patience also. Um, there's been so many questions for us regarding travel bubbles or green lanes, as, a, as, as Bill called them. Um, how important is this? And when do you think they will, um, they, 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 they will come, to, to come to pass? When will they come? When will the travel bubble start? Will they start? Well, I think uh, Malaysian government, to begin with, has been working very closely with Singapore and the ASEAN regions. You know, uh, obviously, uh, you have to be really, very, very careful to look at how we can open this, the border. The, uh, the first thing is, of course, the, the health check. That's something that's important. I think once the countries, within countries, they're able to work it out, then I'm sure this will be uh, happening. Uh, as of, uh, from memory, I think it's August, early August, we're going to open up with uh, Singapore. Um, and from there, you probably can see. Uh, as of when it can really mushroom, I can't give you an answer because we have to track with the government daily. You know, because even they, they, they announce the date, the SOPs will not be out immediately when they announce it. So we then have to be a bit more patient to work. And uh, obviously, you can say they're going to open up on that date by itself. But if anything happened to those countries, just like what's happening to Melbourne, situation changes immediately. So just got to be a bit patient. Thank you. These are definitely, these are definitely some tough times. And I'm sorry to ask you to look yes. into a crystal ball like that. However, I'm also going to ask Jesper Farmquist the same, um, uh, not the same question, but also to look into his, his, his uh, data-driven uh, crystal ball. If there's, Jesper, um, if there's no reopening of international routes this year over the, over the next three to six months, what's going to happen to materialism in Malaysia? Well, fortunately, it's a market that has some domestic uh, business, so it's about staying up. It's about staying afloat. But you can go through any of these markets where you put Maldives and Singapore that requires all inbound. They've got to create some uh, some of these lanes that will be challenged because you set it up between A and B, and then you set it up with C and C says, I don't like the one you're having with E. I mean, it's going to be a challenge. So it's back to what you have. I, I agree with what Bill was saying as well, 2020, no. 21, 22 is like rebuilding and handling, but it's going to be such a thin layer of domestic travel and some ASEAN border crossing that will help. Um, it's it, that reality is, I mean, 2024, 2025, you can dream of having some kind of baseline that you would love for your own profitability, but it's, it's a long way away on that. We don't have a, a I, I think it's wrong to come out with a too positive message, but domestic Low, because in some parts, Malaysia is a big country, right? So uh, you look at the drive and the fly distance. I'm talking about East Malaysia is very, very different. You know, if it is lovely, the habitat that you were talking about earlier, like that kind of initiative, what can you drive through those things? It, it, like a reboot of the country as well. Um, being creative and, and Ricky's thoughts as well. Really, really good stuff. Thank you. Thanks, Jesper. A final question. And, uh, and I'd like to, I'd like to um, end, end on something which is a little bit more positive. Um, Something a little bit more positive. Um, we're going to look at something green. Reza, are you there? Yep, I'm still here. 
Reza, okay, th uh, fantastic. Green tourism. This is, this is surely a trend that's come out of COVID um, and a very positive trend. Um, is this going to be something that's going to resonate with the domestic audience in Malaysia? Because there's going to be no international travel um, the way we're seeing it, um, possibly until the end of the year. Uh, I think so. Um, I think this is a trend that's been happening even before COVID, uh, not just in Malaysia, but globally, right? Everyone is looking for different kinds of connections, different kinds of experiences. Um, I think the, the shoebox hotel model um, is slowly going out of, uh, going out of, uh, uh, out of interest for a lot of people. Uh, people are looking for interesting things to take their kids to and get experience with. And I think nature-based tourism uh, offers uh, a lot of that, whether it's a beach resort, whether it's uh, trekking through national parks, uh, uh, and of course, uh, the, the big trend of things like glamping um, and stuff like that. Um, whether that is going to be found in Malaysia uh, is hard to tell. Um, we've seen a spike of interest in, uh, at the Habitat, at least in uh, travelers from KL on the staycation route. Um, uh, I know that uh, Moon Sen said that the, the rates of searching was quite low, but uh, we still have seen a tremendous amount of interest for people looking for things to do. Um, I think time will tell, but uh, I'd like to think that uh, the COVID trend has caused everybody to want to be outside, be healthier, reconnect to nature, um, and I think nature-based tourism has a lot of that to offer. That's fantastic. David, uh, just to share with you, David, yes, you know, uh, just to follow through with what Riza is say, you know, if, if you have heard of one of our products called Panjaran Hot Spring in Ipoh, uh, which is actually in the natural habitat, um, sits on a 260 million years old limestone resort and with hot spring, natural hot spring, 45 villas, believe me, currently it's doing far better than before COVID. 80% mm. occupancy, four digits room rates. And because it's sitting on 20 hectares then, with a beautiful uh, hot spring resort, natural. And I think those are the places that become um, safe. You know, you, you are less density, natural habitat. People are happy with to, 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 to go to that type of resort. Just, just to follow through one result. No, super, super, superb. It's, it's great yeah. to see that, that, that trend resonating um, in Banjaran also. Um, I'm going to wrap up. Um, if that's okay, everyone. Um, Dato KL Tan, thank you so much for thank joining you. us. Um, uh, Jesper, Hannah, Sen, Reza, Andreas, Ricky, Bill, Vanessa, and from myself, David Johnson, Delivering Age Communications. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye now. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.